Thanks very much. And I'm really glad to see there are actually some young people here. Um, and I have to tell you, unfortunately, uh, you have a problem. Uh, you have a, a big problem. Uh, and I don't want to spend uh, all of my time on gloom and doom and, and problem. Uh, what you really need to know is that the uh, solution is dependent upon you. Um, you know, it's not enough to elect uh, a politician who says they're going to solve the problem. You know, we, we've tried that actually. Barack Obama was elected because of the support of young people who caused him to overcome Hillary in the Iowa primaries. And he said all the right words, that we have a planet in peril, and uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, but he wasted the crisis. He had a crisis, and you should never waste a crisis. He had this economic crisis in 2008, and he could have taken steps that would have really changed the direction uh, in the United States and then in the world, but that didn't happen. Uh, so y you need to uh, influence the system. It's, it's great to do, do individual actions that try to reduce your emissions and things, but that's not going to solve the problem. You actually have to affect the political system. So that's what I want to, uh, uh, that, that's an old book. <laughs> that's, that's 10 years old. And within the next few months, I'm going to finish my second book, which is Sophie's Planet. And it's referring to your planet, to the planet of all young people. And uh, uh, I, I'm going to try to, um, help you understand what, uh, what is needed. Uh, so, uh, let me, um, do, am I controlling this? I control it this way. Yeah, ac actually it's uh, encouraging that some young people are beginning to realize that there is a crisis. And I hope that their numbers grow but numbers are not enough. Uh, we have to have leaders uh, who actually uh, will do the right things. So that's what I want to try to um, help you understand. Now, I was uh, lucky to be grown up, to, to grow up at, at a time when it was not difficult for uh, the, the child of a tenant farmer to go to the university. You know, it's, uh, it was mentioned, I was born in 1941. I was born before the United States entered World War II. So I've been around, so I have seen a lot. And, you know, we need to understand, at that era, I, so I grew up in the era of uh, Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy. Truman was actually a, a great president. You know, he, when he campaigned in 1948 against Dewey, he went into the South and, and uh, argued for civil rights at a time decades ahead of uh, the other politicians. And he, uh, he was the author of the Marshall Plan. He didn't want his name on it because that would have made it harder for it to get uh, accepted by Congress. Uh, but he was the one responsible for the Marshall Plan. And, uh, for, and you know, at that time, the United States uh, helped form the uh, United Nations. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and set up these organizations uh, which were essential for the progress that was made. And it was not a case of zero-sum game. The United States actually gave 
a lot of money and credit to uh, the defeated nations included, Germany and Japan. The standard of living uh, throughout the, the Western world increased. It's not a zero-sum game. Uh, and um, the United States exercised leadership, which is going to be all the more essential for the problems that uh, exist, not just a climate problem, but cybersecurity, pandemics, uh, control avoidance of nuclear problems. You need to have strong international organizations. And, and so we can't abandon that and make it every country for itself. Uh, uh, okay. The other thing, you know, I, I was lucky to study under uh, Professor Van Allen. Um, who discovered the radiation belts uh, around the Earth. He had the instrument on the very first United States uh, satellite. Um, but I learned uh, in his physics department uh, the scientific method. Uh, it seems very simple. You have to study all of the available data on the problem of interest. And you need to be very skeptical of your interpretation, because you're the easiest one to fool. And you, when you get new data, you have to reassess your uh, interpretation from scratch. And uh, perhaps most difficult, you can't let your preference or your ideology affect your assessment of the problem. Um, that Sounds simple, but in fact, it's, it's difficult, uh, even among professional scientists. You tend to get to have an opinion or a preference and, and are not looking at the data in a completely unbiased and uh, skeptical, uh, skeptical way. Um, and uh, just to... Uh, there's an article that just came out a couple of days ago in uh, the newspaper showing the uh, change of inflation adjusted income for each age group. And you see how our politics have rigged the system in favor of old people. Uh, it, the income of, of the younger people has not increased uh, at all, while the older people uh, has substantially. And make it even more obvious, this is the uh, federal debt as a share of the gross domestic product. In other words, and it's showing how the uh, federal debt is continuing to increase. So old people are borrowing money from you. And uh, you're, you're going to have to pay back. And it, the, the interest on the federal debt is, uh, is, a, is a problem. And it's going to become a bigger problem. And this is because, again, the, the system has been rigged against you. So you should be getting mad. You know, you should, you need to understand this. now. Okay, now I, it can be fixed, but you need to understand the system. Let's talk about the climate situation. Basically, um, it's hard to recognize that there's a crisis because the climate system has tremendous inertia, and that's comes mainly from the ocean, which is four kilometers deep. So as you apply some forcing to the climate system, it, it can only change slowly. The ocean temperature can only change slowly. Uh, and what that means is that we're now forcing the system, but the system has only partly responded to that forcing. 
because of the inertia. So there's more, and the forcing that we're applying is uh, greenhouse gases, which carbon dioxide and methane um, and a few other gases, which reduce heat radiation to space. So that causes an energy imbalance. So there's more energy coming in from the sun than heat radiated to space. And so the planet, of course, warms up. But it takes the ocean a long time to warm up. And so there's still more warming in the pipeline. It, the planet is out of balance now. And our climate system turns out to be uh, sensitive. There are amplifying feedbacks in the system. For example, as the planet gets warmer, it reduces the area of ice and snow. And that causes absorption of more sunlight because the surface that's exposed underneath the ice and snow is darker than the ice and snow, so it absorbs more sunlight. So that's an example of an amplifying feedback. It turns out that our climate, and there are diminishing feedbacks also, but it turns out our climate system is dominated by amplifying feedbacks. And that's the reason that we can have large climate oscillations. This part of the planet, all, essentially all of Canada and parts of the uh, United States were under ice, an ice sheet, uh, 20,000 years ago. As a result of a very weak forcing, small perturbations in the Earth's orbit, but because of these amplifying feedbacks, when they have enough time, they can cause a very large climate change. So the danger is that we can push the system to the point where we lose control of the system because of the amplifying feedback. So that's what we have to avoid. And we're getting very uh, close to a very dangerous situation. Um, temperature has increased more than one degree Celsius, or about two degrees Fahrenheit, averaged over the planet and averaged over the last hundred years, with most of that warming in the last 50 years, which makes the temperature warmer than it has been in the Holocene, which is the current interglacial period. Um, the maximum was about half a degree Celsius warmer than the pre-industrial level, but we're now more than one degree Celsius warmer. So we're now well outside the range of this period in which civilization uh, developed. And as I've already mentioned, it, it, because of the blanketing effect of these gases, the planet is out of energy balance, and we can now measure how far the planet is out of energy balance. Because where does that energy go? Well, it has to go into the ocean. Uh, because the conductivity of the continents is very low, so it's only the upper tens of meters of the soil that will change temperature over a time scale of decades or a century. But the ocean mixes, and so you can mix heat into a very deep ocean. So that's where the energy goes, and we now measure uh, the temperature very accurately, and we, when we find that the planet is out of energy balance with more the upper ocean gaining heat and the deeper ocean gaining heat and some ice melting and some heat going into the ground, the total imbalance is now about three quarters of a watt per meter squared, which doesn't sound like much, but it's the equivalent of, of exploding 500,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs per day, every day of the year. That's how much extra energy is going into the ocean and it's warming the ocean. And one of the consequences, and, and this is actually the most threatening consequence for young people and future generations, and that's the change of the sea level. Um, as the ocean warms, it melts the ice shelves, the tongues of ice that come out from Antarctica and Greenland into the ocean, 
those begin to melt as the ocean gets warmer, and that allows the ice sheets to discharge their icebergs to the ocean uh, faster. And so, as a result, the sea level is beginning to rise. The rate now is a little more than three millimeters a year, which is a, a little more than a foot in a century, which is a nuisance, but not uh, a huge disaster. But that rate of melt has doubled, more than doubled uh, twice in the last century. And if we continue with business as usual on greenhouse gases, our modeling suggests that we'll get several more doublings and we'll get to the point of getting several meters of sea level rise on a time scale of 50 to 150 years. If we let that happen, that would mean that all uh, coastal cities would become uh, dysfunctional. And the economic, uh, more than half of the large cities in the world are on coastlines. So we can't let that happen. This, it, uh, uh, the economic consequences uh, and the human consequences would be um, unbelievable. Uh, so we, entire uh, nations like Bangladesh and the Netherlands and Florida and, and it, a few hundred million people in China would be underwater if we, if we go down that path. The other thing that is irreversible on any time scale that people would care about is uh, extermination of species. We're putting pressure on different species in many different ways. But if you combine that with a shifting of climate zones, then uh, many species cannot move fast enough to stay within a climate zone that, that they can um, survive in. And so there's the danger of pushing a significant fraction of the species on the planet to extinction. So another reason why we don't want large climate change uh, to occur. For example, coral reefs, there's more than a million species associated with coral reefs, and we're now losing coral reefs at a rate of more than 1% a year um, due to both the warming of the ocean and the acidification of the ocean from the carbon dioxide. So uh, again, a, a reason why we need to uh, stop the growth of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And we can also see on a regional scale, you can begin to see that the planet is getting warmer. The natural variability of local temperature is larger than the global warming of two degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but uh, you can, but especially in the summer, you should be able, if you're as old as I am, you should notice that the seasons are getting warmer. Uh, this shows the United States, uh, the summer season and the winter season. And you see the summer season, the bell curve that des describes the range of uh, summer mean temperatures, uh, the natural variability range is shifting toward warmer temperatures. And it's a, it should be noticeable in the summer. It's shifted by more than one standard deviation. In the winter, the shift is not as large. Uh, but if you go to other parts of the world, if you go to the subtropics, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East, the shift is uh, larger in the summer, so that every summer is now warmer than it was 50 years ago. And in uh, tropical regions like Southeast Asia, these regions are becoming uncomfortable in the summer. Uh, and uh, that is, if we allow that, again, if we stay on the path that we're on, these parts of the world will become less, um, less habitable, will increase the migration pressure uh, from these regions. 
And, and of course, these regions are not the ones that are causing the problem. Most of the emissions are coming from the wealthy high latitude nations. So it's a case of, uh, of injustice, but it's a, it will be a problem for everybody, not just uh, those regions. Um, yeah, so the, this sh shifting of the uh, temperature curve does have an effect on regional climate which is beginning to be noticeable, where the dry regions, you get greater uh, summer temperature extremes and more extreme droughts and the fires that go with that. But at the times, you also get more evaporation. So the places that are wet tend to get more extreme wetness. So you get more extreme floods. Uh, in those parts of the world that are wet or those times uh, that you get uh, rainfall, it can be heavier because a warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor. So we see this in uh, the fires. This happens to be in, in Greece uh, last year, and that's some of the impact of that. And we see in the United States the fires, uh, wildfires are increasing and the floods, the 100-year floods, are occurring more than once a century. Uh, this is in Japan where they had incredible floods this last summer. And those storms that are driven by latent heat of water vapor can become stronger. That means tropical storms, uh, tornadoes and uh, thunderstorms have the potential to be stronger because there's more water vapor in the atmosphere and the ocean surface is warmer. So these are the potential injustices. It's today's adults uh, to young people, but also the north to the south because uh, we're, we in the north are burning most of the world's carbon budget uh, and the consequences are felt worldwide. And then of course it's humans to all other species. So in a sense though you can say all of these are injustices of the older generation to the younger generation. So this is um, what you should be aware of. <clears throat> 